Great. Uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming this evening. Uh, this paper is very much a work in, in progress. I'm sort of halfway through my, my fellowship, which is sort of well-timed to really make you think about what you uh, have done so far and what you need to do in your remaining uh, time. Uh, and I hope that my colleagues uh, here at Capas will hear uh, how I've been wrestling with many of the themes uh, that we've been discussing. So my title, Ethics for the End of the World, can be read in at least two ways. It can mean a way of living during the end of the world, or it can mean an ethics oriented towards the end of the world, living in the apocalypse or living apocalyptically, thinking in the apocalypse or thinking apocalyptically. I think our moment requires operating at the juncture of both these modes of thinking about ethics for the end of the world. We are living through a slow apocalypse, though the speed and force of this ending is experienced differently by different groups of people. And the way that this world is ending, which may be an endless ending, reveals why the end of the world is the only thing worth beginning. This end, I'm going to argue, is difficult, perhaps impossible to think. And at least uh, for me, this is one of the most interesting things to come out of the, the conversations uh, that we've been having uh, over the, the past months, is that uh, while I thought I had spent a lot of time thinking about the apocalypse, I think I realized I had thought a lot about the history of apocalypticism, but not really what it means uh, to wrestle with the end of the world. Now, in some ways, this might seem a strange place to begin because we are surrounded by imaginings of the end in films, fiction, TV, and art. Yet for all the imaginings of the end as threat or uh, imagining life after the end, the end itself is rarely thought. Even outside of these cultural productions, apocalyptic imagery serves a political function invoked in order to justify actions in the present or to imagine uh, the possibility of other ways of living but always in the name of avoiding the end. The end itself, again, remains unthought. And I think this is because it's so difficult to think, and it's that, that difficulty that I would like uh, to think with you this evening, uh, both as a, a kind of uh, a, an existential dread or the source of an existential dread and also uh, the source of a kind of possibility. What does it mean to think the apocalypse or to think in a way that is shaped by the unthinkable real that the apocalypse names? And in, in exploring that, uh, the kind of ethics that I'm uh, imagining here, uh, I'm not going to argue that you necessarily should think uh, about the apocalypse or think apocalyptically as, as, as if it's some sort of solution that will enable you to live a better life. That certainly won't make you happier. Uh, it probably won't help you be more just. And I'm not sure that it will help us confront problems like climate change. To think apocalyptically is to go through a kind of undoing, to confront an abyss an experience of vertiginousness that I find very difficult to describe, which is probably why apocalypticism collapses distinctions between mysticism, philosophy, poetry, and religion. Uh, and, and lots of texts uh, that talk about the end of the world, there's this notion that the end lies beyond critique. So there's a different kind of mode of thinking uh, at work here, uh, and it's that mode of thinking that I, I find very uh, intriguing, but also very elusive. I'm particularly interested in thinking about the apocalypse or thinking apocalyptically in a way that detaches the apocalyptic from redemption or salvation. Classically, apocalypticism is understood to be a revelation. This revelation is frequently accompanied by catastrophe, and that catastrophe marks the end, which is also the salvation for some and judgment for others. Historically, this form of apocalypticism emerges in situations of profound despair. Apocalypticism is the political theological option for those who find that the world has rendered life unlivable. This classic vision is also deeply connected to the logic of theodicy, which explains suffering by locating it within a redemptive narrative, even a redemptive narrative that includes a catastrophe. And in opposition to this logic, I want to think about an apocalypticism that accepts the fact that, meaning, that some suffering is meaningless and rejects attempts to redeem those experiences in any way. This relationship between apocalypticism, redemption, and theodicy uh, would require an additional paper uh, or a book, which is my plan. Uh, but I mentioned it uh, here at the outset because I think it really shapes the way that I think uh, about uh, apocalypticism. So I'll keep coming back to this theme of how do we avoid uh, the, the temptation of redemption. Um, and we could talk more about that uh, later if, if you so wish. And really what I want to to do is, is to think about uh, one key example of how uh, a political theologian has thought through apocalypticism. 
uh, in order to see the value of this form of thought, or at least to sketch the kind of general trends of that way of thinking, uh, while also identifying some key limitations of traditional political theology. And then uh, in the second half, or maybe like the latter third, 25% uh, of the paper, I'm going to begin to outline uh, some alternative resources for thinking apocalyptically. Uh, in order to do this, I will briefly outline what I mean by political theology before turning to one of the field's uh, sort of marginal figures, uh, Jakob Taubus. Uh, Talbis uh, offers one of the most compelling political theological accounts of apocalypticism, uh, and he is the rarest of rare things, a self-identified apocalyptic. Uh, in political theology, um, which I mean is a, a diverse field, so of course like any two-sentence summary will be a little bit reductive, but uh, in general, messianism is the kind of good option. Uh, messianism, particularly uh, after Derrida, has this kind of ethical dimension where apocalypticism involves a form of fanaticism. It is calling for the end of the world or anticipating, hoping in the end of the world in some sense. Uh, and so it is often uh, seen as a more problematic tradition within political theology, uh, which makes, makes Taubes very uh, unique in uh, just claiming that label for himself. Uh, now, despite this, I think there are dimensions to apocalypticism that require moving beyond Taubus, and with some help from his contemporary Gunther Anders, I'll argue that Taubus uh, does not address what it means to think the end of the world when the end is an actual possibility, uh, and he turns away from what Anders calls an apocalypse without a kingdom, or a naked apocalypse. It is precisely this form of apocalypticism which provides a starting point for an ethics for the end of the world. Uh, which I'll uh, develop by drawing on the writings of Amy Césaire and Franz uh, Fanon. Uh, and, and, and there, too, uh, Césaire and Fanon, uh, the relationship between the two uh, and the, their own trajectories over the course of their life are very complex. But I think there's something uh, very obvious in their work uh, about how they are struggling with the problem of the world uh, that can inform an apocalypticism. Political theology uh, is a phrase that means different things to different people. Uh, so I'll explain what I mean by that term. Uh, I don't mean that there aren't other valid ways of uh, using the term. It's a touchy subject in political theology. Political theology, in my sense, is a multidisciplinary approach that shares two key concerns. First, a genealogical analysis of the relationship between theology and the political. And second, a concern with the limits or boundaries of the political. So in this sense, the political would be uh, uh, different from politics. So politics might be the procedures through which governance happens, and the political, the frequently obscured or unquestioned foundations that enable those forms of governance. Things are never that tidy in reality, but that kind of distinction might help us think about what kinds of questions political theology is interested in. So it's not interested in, for example, like should Christians vote? It's not that kind of question, uh, but more about questions of legitimacy, beginnings, endings, and crises, the historical and conceptual relationship between theology and the political. Now, the sense of political theology is still most strongly associated with Carl Schmitt, the Nazi jurist whose 1922 book, Political Theology, provides probably the most quoted passage in the field. All significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts. And he's joined by Walter Benjamin, Giorgio Gombin, more recent people like Slavoj Žižek, and others to form a kind of political theological canon. And I think if we think about that canon, there's a sort of narrow and broader sense in which we can uh, approach political theology. Uh, and I'm going to be moving between those, uh, those two approaches uh, in the course of the paper. Narrowly, there are those who self-identify as political theologians and are particularly engaged with this intellectual tradition, the one defined by the canon. More broadly, though, there are people engaged in political theological investigations, but who either don't adopt this label or outright reject it. This broader field would include people like Sylvia Federici, Saba Mahmoud, Sylvia Winter, Denise Ferrer de Silva, and, and many others. Uh, and if you are interested in political theology, the Political Theology Network, uh, which is emerged out of, I think that's sort of the right way of framing it, out, emerged out of the Political Theology uh, Journal, is currently running a project where they're expanding those people who are thought of as resources for political theological work in a series of open access uh, essays that's really, really useful uh, and is a great introduction to political theology. Now, Talbis uh, is a Jewish political theologian in the narrow sense of the term. 
1987, uh, not too far where I'm standing, uh, from where I'm standing, uh, Talbas gave a series of lectures on the Apostle Paul. It was hosted by the Protestant Institute for Interdisciplinary Research in Heidelberg uh, and was remarkable for a number of reasons. Uh, one, Talbas was battling terminal cancer uh, and couldn't stand to deliver the lectures. So this, these lectures were his kinds of dying act, at least uh, intellectually. Uh, and uh, in the course of the lectures and uh, lectures in, in an appendix that's uh, attached to the post, uh, post posthumously uh, published collection of lectures, Talbus discusses his relation with Schmidt. So remember, Schmidt, the Nazi, uh, Talbus, the Jew, have this un, uh, unexpected relationship. And without going too far into that history, which is its own kinds of sort of gossipy like thing. It was, it was, I mean, there's a lot of interesting history there uh, about sort of German intellectual uh, connections between people on the right and, and uh, Jewish thinkers. Um, Talbus expresses a, a kind of appreciation for Schmidt. Uh, they corresponded, Schmidt sends Talbus his publications. He tells everyone that the only person who understands him is the Jewish Talbus. And so, you know, everyone who accuses him of anti-Semitism needs to like kind of get over it. Uh, and Talbus writes to Schmidt, even going so far as to call him a friend. At the same time, Talbus does not shy away from Schmidt's anti-Semitism. Uh, so uh, there's this, this complicated relationship. Uh, and in the course of this appendix, Talbus uh, summarizes the difference between their perspectives. Uh, and it's in a passage. It's a little bit long. Uh, but I, I'll read the whole thing just because these, this will provide like the kind of key phrases for the rest of the, the paper. Schmidt's interest was in only one thing, that the chaos not rise to the top, that the state remain no matter what the price. This is what he later calls the catacon, the retainer that holds down the chaos that pushes up from below. That isn't my worldview, that isn't my experience. I can imagine as an apocalyptic, let it go down. I have no spiritual investment in the world as it is. But I understand that someone else is invested in this world and sees in the apocalypse, whatever its form, the adversary, and does everything to keep it subjugated and suppressed, because from there forces can be unleashed that we are in no position to control. You can see now what I want from Schmidt. I want to show him that the separation of powers between worldly and spiritual is absolutely necessary. This boundary, if it is not drawn, we will lose our occidental breath. Now, uh, apocalypticism uh, was not a new theme for Talbus. He uh, only published one monograph during his life in 1947, entitled Occidental Eschatology. And in many ways, the book is just a standard genealogy of eschatological thinking. It's one that you find in other books published during this, this period. Uh, but it's combined with a poetic philosophical style that moves from thinking about apocalypticism to thinking apocalyptically in very interesting ways. He argues that freedom is essential to apocalypticism. It is the means by which the structure of this world prison will burst apart. It is not opposed to this or that aspect of the world, but rejects the world in its fullness, in the name of a new totality. It's not some figural use of apocalypticism. Talbus is not interested in an apocalyptic tone. He writes of an annihilating God who crushes the world. His apocalypticism is revolutionary, but not in a way that is concerned with changing the structure of society, but one that directs its gaze away from the world. It's not a question of improvement, even at a grand scale, but a negation of the basic foundations of the world. Now, in his earlier work, like Occidental Eschatology, Talbot discusses this apocalypticism uh, in a way that is tinged by the peculiar hope that comes with the assurance that the end is coming, an anticipation of a new covenant. So at the very end of Occidental Eschatology, he describes the coming holy terror that will shake the foundations of the world. In his later work, this hope is replaced by kind of practiced indifference, which Talbus describes uh, as a form of nihilism. Uh, and riffing off of 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31, he says there's no reason to make uh, revolution when it is all about to end. I sort of, when I read Talbus, I go for moments of just like elation and the way that someone articulates something uh, as a sentiment that I so deeply share. Uh, and then he comes to something where he's like, look, just pay your taxes, don't cause any trouble, don't go to protests. Look, it's all about to burn anyway. And you're like, no, Talbus, why? 
Uh, and, and so he, he describes this uh, in relation to, to first, first Corinthians. And the passage has a kind of aesthetic dimension and is often read in terms of what it's saying about uh, sex between uh, um, spouses. Uh, but if we sort of leave that to the side, uh, we can preserve the form uh, of a rejection of the world in which we live uh, as though not. So let even those who mourn uh, act as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. So there's this kind of withdrawal from the world, uh, becoming indifferent to the way that the world operates, which is the basis of a, an apocalyptic hope that the end is coming, and we don't need to worry about the world anymore. And you see this historically, uh, apocalyptic movements often uh, throw uh, you know, all uh, morals to the wind, they engage in all kinds of uh, sexual practices, they rethink gender norms, they burn their crops. Uh, and so this, this sense that we can act in a way uh, that reflects that the present form of this world is passing away uh, sort of recurs throughout, throughout history. Taubes uh, thus provides us with a starting point in our efforts to think through an ethics for the end of the world. He rejects the world as a whole in its totality. He sees no point in attempting to reform the world. Uh, yet there's also something deeply compassionate about Taubes' uh, apocalypticism. Uh, and there's, this was something I sort of was in, uh, intuiting in Taubes, uh, and it occurred to me before, but uh, a, a review, which I, is not recent, but which I recently read by uh, Anthony Paul Smith, really um, brought this to the fore, which is that nowhere in his work is Taubes trying to persuade people to become apocalyptic. Uh, and when he contrasts his position with Schmidt, he says that he understands that they stand on different sides of an apocalyptic promise. They live out different relations to the world. This is even more pronounced when Talbus reenacts an internal dialogue he had with himself when he was deciding whether or not he should visit Schmidt. There's a number of years where uh, he is writing to people and other people are writing to him saying, oh, you should go visit Schmidt. And Talbus is like, I mean, he was a Nazi. I'm not really sure that I want to legitimate his uh, life by going and visiting with him. Uh, and in the end, he does. But so he has this, this debate, which he relates in this internal uh, monologue, uh, saying that it's not his place to judge Schmidt, because as a Jew, he wasn't even tempted by national socialism. Uh, he writes, we were blessed in the sense that we couldn't even take part. I find that remarkable, this, this sense that uh, his uh, exclusion from society in a particular way has denied him the temptation of Nazism. He doesn't even have to think about that particular relation to the world. Uh, and the result of, uh, of this, this, these reflections on occidental uh, um, eschatology, the history of that way of thinking, those concepts, his relation with, with relationship with Schmidt, uh, results in one of the most compelling political theological visions of apocalypticism, mm -hmm. uh, in which one is spiritually disinvested from the world, mm -hmm. attempting to live out an indifference to its promises, fully aware that this refusal of the world is not a form of moral superiority or wisdom, but an attempt to navigate the unlivable. Mm -hmm. But Taubes is only a starting point, and there are two uh, points on which I would like to depart from Taubes in order to think in ethics for the end of the world. First, he defines apocalypse, apocalypticism uh, in opposition to the world as a whole, uh, but he also argues that there's something beyond this world, something which is entirely other. There will be a new covenant, and this beyond is both totally other and somehow connected to an occidental breath. Uh, this is a very enigmatic passage that uh, almost no one discusses. It's very rarely, I mean, the, the passage in which it occurs is often discussed uh, in writings on Talbus, uh, but that this, I mean, it's a very strange phrase, occidental breath, uh, and it goes uh, unmentioned. Saitia Brata Das has argued that this breath uh, is part of a negative political theology, a kind of anti-political apocalypticism. It's a refusal to lay claim to worldly sovereign power in the name of the divine, to uphold the division between the worldly and the spiritual. So if we go back, this, this is the point. Uh, uh, occidental breath is the thing that is connected to this division between the worldly and the spiritual. But when Talbus uses this term occidental, even if he's not using it in some sort of naive or simplistic way, it's still the label uh, that is, he is assuming for the legacy of thinking about the world. Uh, and I have questions about this uh, ostentatious breath. 
Uh, and relatedly, he doesn't address what it means to be an apocalyptic at a moment in which the world is really ending, or in the wreckage of worlds that have already ended. How does this negative political theology operate in the midst of the end? What are the ethics that govern how we spiritually disinvest from a world while others suffer the consequences of its material collapse? In short, we need to rethink Talbot's political theology of the world. Second, Talbot is fearful that apocalypticism will spill over into nihilism. Though there are places where he uses the term nihilistic in a kind of affirmative or positive sense, in occidental eschatology, he warns that if apocalypticism is disconnected from a new covenant, from the promise of a new world, it becomes empty nothingness. It will become a nihilistic revolution close to satanic practice and leading into the abyss. And when confronted with that abyss, Taubes turns away, back towards the promise of a new covenant to redemption and the preservation of occidental breath, necessary for a proper apocalypticism. So to understand how we might go beyond Taubes, let's turn to the work of one of his contemporaries, Gunther Anders. Uh, in 1959, uh, Anders wrote about the difficulty of truly thinking the end. He took up this question in response to the nuclear age. And for Anders, there are two things that make this nuclear apocalypticism qualitatively different from earlier Jewish and Christian eschatologies. First, the threat of the end is now objectively real, and the world is unified by this threat. It is not a matter of one community or a way of life ending, but humanity itself. This introduces a new form of apocalypticism. And what Anders couldn't have known was that these same detonations would eventually be taken as one potential marker of the Anthropocene, the nuclear tests of the mid 20th century weren't just military performances and scientific achievements, they were ecological events. Nearly all things were affected by these tests, indicating the ecological agency that some humans now possess. And indeed, people, uh, living things, still bear the traces of this, this testing. And while there are debates about the name for this epoch, the Anthropocene, and when we should locate its start, from a political theological perspective, these debates provide an opportunity to think of the world as something that is invented and imposed. And there are a variety of genealogical investigations into this invention and imposition. Uh, Sylvia Winter's landmark essay, 1492, The Invention of a New World Order, uh, could just be renamed The Invention of the World Order. Uh, Sylvia Federici, Denise Fra de Silva, there's a, a variety of works which are trying to uh, trace the invention and imposition uh, of this uh, this world. And it's a story saturated in apocalypses and apocalypticism. Columbus's voyage was motivated in part by his millennialism. He departs a Europe still recovering from the devastation of the plague and begins the process of bringing the diseases that along with colonial violence will eventually wipe out as much as 90% of the population of some regions in what would be called the Americas. This leads Emmanuel Leroy Laudery to argue that we are unified by disease. Worlds are destroyed as the globe is transformed into the world. Now, when Talbot speaks of the world, he takes this world as given, not made, or at least not made by, by humans. Uh, and this is particularly important given his insistence on preserving occidental breath. Again, not many people talk about this phrase, but uh, Daniel Coluccio Barber, in one of the few essays that does, uh, argues that Talbot may oppose the spatio-temporal order of the world, but he does so from within the spatio-temporal order called Occident. Mm -hmm. To explain uh, maybe a little bit more uh, why this is an issue, let me borrow a distinction from the philosopher and sinologist Francois Julien. So Julien differentiates between the universal and the uniform. The universal understands itself as necessary in the sense of the a priori. It's universal by nature. Uh, when we talk about human, universal human rights, uh, we don't mean that they're universal in the sense that everyone has equal access to them, as just looking at the world would tell us. Uh, rather, we mean that all human beings, by virtue of being human beings, uh, necessarily have those human rights. Uh, even if those rights are disregarded, they, they still possess them. Now, the uniform surrenders this a priori, but gains hegemony. Julian describes it as having a pandemic quality it is everywhere, but lacks the imperative of the universal. Global capitalism is the prime example of this uniform. You can operate counter to the logics of global capital, but you do so in a world governed by its logic. So how does this help us uh, understand Taubes' political theology of the world and, and diverge from it? The world is the uniform operating under the masquerade of the universal. Objections to the notion of the world, I think, operate in opposition to this presumed universality. 
Yet by naming the world as uniform rather than universal, we expose the world as a project. Rather than the idea of the world being Eurocentric or Western, we can say that the world is Eurocentric and Western, uh, even Occidental, not in the sense of the universal, but as a result of a centuries-long project that has taken the planet and transformed it into the world. The spatiotemporal order called the Occident is the origin of the world, uh, and it's this uh, legacy to which Talbot's gestures, uh, albeit in a very oblique way, uh, in his uh, summary of the difference between him and Schmidt. So when Talbus awaits the end of the world, he waits the end of a universal world that is really uniform without disrupting that uniformity. And in leaving the nature of the world that ends unthought, uh, at least to any real uh, degree, uh, Talbus uh, sort of mis mischarts uh, a topography of power. Uh, Talbus claims to offer an apocalypse from below. So in another passage, he describes his relationship to Schmidt as saying, basically, uh, they sit uh, in relation to a catacomb, Schmidt on top, uh, Talbus below, and Talbus uh, is offering an apocalypse from below. Schmidt is repressing the apocalypse from above. And on one level, this, this clearly makes sense. Talbus' uh, chaotic apocalypse is something that Schmidt can only see as a disaster. But on another level, his apocalypse from below remains invested in occidental breath. And if he wants to maintain a divide between the spiritual and the worldly, then this divide must be rearticulated in a way that disinvests from this occidental legacy. So let's go back to, to Anders. If you recall, uh, Anders says there are two things that differentiate the contemporary apocalyptic situation from the history of apocalyptic thinking in Judaism and Christianity. The first we've addressed in reconfiguring Talbus's political theology of the world. So now we come to the second. Uh, Anders describes our new apocalypticism as a naked apocalypse or an apocalypse without a kingdom. What we have come to think of as the apocalypse, oh, we have come to think of the apocalypse as that which will, should be avoided at all costs. It is important to remember that this cataconic uh, position is not the only side to apocalypticism. The apocalypse is also a revelation, an end to the world which brings with it a promise. The apocalyptic movements that emerged throughout history are in this sense hopeful. It's just that their hopefulness is not in the world, but in its end. This hopeful apocalypticism is one of three eschatological possibilities Anders considers. The first he names apocalypse with a kingdom, this, this apocalypticism in its sort of classical form. We also have the narrative of perpetual progress, a kingdom without an apocalypse. And finally, the threat of nuclear annihilation presents us with the possibility of an apocalypse without a kingdom. This is the possibility of a senseless apocalypse. And just as with the first point, we can extend Anders' argument to climate change. There is no redemption, at least not for humanity, in the prospect of ecological destruction. As we saw earlier, Talbot shares this concern, uh, not in terms of a nuclear threat, not in, in quite the same way. He's more interested in it in a kind of, as a theoretical potential, but he shares the same sense of an existential dread of an apocalypse without a kingdom. He fears the demonic potential of an apocalypse that is not accompanied by the promise of a new covenant. So both Anders and Talbus capture something unsettling about this apocalypticism shorn of redemption. Uh, and I'm not saying that like a nuclear annihilation or uh, climate change are, are, are good things, but I am interested in this, this sense that uh, you, see, you sort of have messianism and messianism is kind of good because it brings with it a kind of salvation or redemption. And then you have apocalypticism which can sort of be good, but is a little bit more dangerous, so long as there's a new covenant which is coming at the end on the other side of the chaos. And then you have this, this abyssal apocalypticism in which things just end, or at least uh, there is an ending without a promise. And it's that notion of an ending without a promise, that form of naked apocalypticism or an apocalypse without a kingdom uh, that I find uh, very interesting. At the beginning of this paper, I mentioned uh, that there are narrower and broader ways of thinking about political theology. And recently, there's been a surge in publications of classic, uh, addressing classic political theological themes, biopolitics, freedom, sovereignty, the human life exception, uh, the, in the sense of the political exception. Uh, and, and these books are very interesting in that they are, uh, in many ways, touching on this narrow political theological canon uh, but in, in very different ways. Freedom is critiqued as a myth, foundational to hierarchical understandings of the human. Sovereignty is rejected in favor of exploring new forms of politics. Uh, it's, 
it's drawing, but then dramatically reconfiguring this political theological uh, body of concepts. Uh, it's diverse, a uh, diverse body of literature, so I don't want to pretend that there's any kind of consensus, but there are two recurring themes in this literature. First, uh, there is repeatedly a call for the end of the world, sometimes phrased uh, using the term apocalypse, uh, but often just the end of the world. And second, this call is articulated through an engagement with the work of Amy Césaire and France Fanon. I just very briefly, uh, for context, Césaire and uh, Fanon were both born uh, in the first part of the 20th century in Martinique. Uh, both were educated in France uh, and both went on to be involved uh, both in uh, producing a wide variety of writings uh, and to be involved in politics, Césaire in Martinique uh, and Fanon in, Al in Algeria. And there are some uh, sort of tenuous but interesting connections between Talbot and uh, Césaire and Fanon, but I thought that was probably slightly too, too in the weeds, but we could come back to it if, if people are interested. So, uh, so I'm interested in this idea that there is an attempt to think apocalyptically through Césaire and Fanon, uh, and this attempt to think apocalyptically uh, both shares much of what is happening in Talbot, but presents us uh, with an apocalypse without a kingdom not in the sense of a nuclear annihilation or ecological catastrophe, uh, but an ending without the promise of a kingdom. Uh, not necessarily that there isn't something that comes after, just that whatever that thing is, is no longer thought of in terms of uh, a kingdom which has all sorts of connotations, particularly related to sovereignty. So in 1939, uh, Césaire wrote to the editor of uh, Volonté about the ending of a poem that he had been working on describing it as uh, very vertiginous, uh, sorry, more vertiginous uh, and more final. The poem uh, was Notebook on the Return to a Native Land, and the poem would go on to become poems as he produced multiple versions uh, in 1947 and one in 1956. And it's probably his most famous work alongside discourse on colonialism, certainly for people like me who are, just, are interested in Césaire from a more kind of theoretical perspective. And it's of particular interest to those of us uh, working on apocalypticism because of this frequently cited passage. We do have to start. Start what? The only thing in the world worth starting, the end of the world, for heaven's sake. This passage appears in a startling number of books on the end of the world. Uh, as very frequently an epigraph, uh, and even when it appears in the, the course of a text, it often sort of shows up as a, uh, almost like a, a, a refrain. I mean, very often people aren't interested in Césaire's work. There'll be a brief mention of, uh, of Césaire and negritude. Uh, sometimes it's not even Césaire that's being uh, cited, but Fanon's citing of Césaire. Uh, and I'm very intrigued by this passage, uh, one, because sounds very apocalyptic, um, uh, and also because uh, it comes uh, partway through a poem uh, which is thoroughly uh, eschatological uh, by Césaire. Uh, so on that thoroughly apocalyptic, uh, or at least eschatological, nature. Uh, this, this passage doesn't appear until one of the 1947 poems. Uh, I was very thankful for uh, uh, Alex Gill, who works on um, Césaire, he helped me figure this out. Uh, the, the figuring out the different versions of this poem uh, is uh, a contentious endeavor. Uh, but the various manifestations of the poem all share a kind of messianic or apocalyptic energy. They mobilize political theological language. And this language is used to think the possibility of an impossible future, an invention which requires a break in destruction. And I think thinking through some of these tensions and the changes in the different versions of the poem will help us begin the process of understanding the apocalypse in terms of the abyssal. I think it's also interesting, I mean, Césaire talks uh, uh, in an essay called uh, Poetry and Knowledge about poetry as its own kind of form of knowledge. Uh, and I think there is something uh, in the way that uh, he explores apocalypticism in a poetic form, uh, which kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, that it enables a kind of thinking uh, that uh, philosophy or political theology uh, might not be able to produce, or at least might not be able to uh, initiate. And in some ways, Talbus uh, agrees. Talbus writes on uh, surrealism. Uh, Césaire is informed by, uh, by surrealism, and, and Talbus sees uh, a kind of Gnostic apocalyptic influence in surrealism, uh, which we can then see at work in Césaire. So uh, the 1939 uh, edition of the poem opens with a perspectiveless description of the Antilles, a survey of destitution and humiliation. 
It is the end of first light, and everything is stagnant, inert, and defeated. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, Césaire gives us a scene uh, of Christmas, and people are singing and dancing, and there's a party, uh, and at the peak of its ascent, joy bursts like a cloud, the songs don't stop, but roll now anxious and heavy through the valleys of fear, the tunnels of anguish, and the fires of hell. And just after this uh, description of Christmas, uh, we gain a perspective. There's an I, a, a first-person narrator arrives in the poem. Uh, uh, a first-person narrator who some have uh, argued is a, a messianic figure. And this messianic uh, figure uh, remembers Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution and the birth of negritude uh, and begins this kind of messianic journey of liberating uh, the people of the Antilles. But all along, this messianic, uh, messianic vision is, is combined with an apocalyptic theme. And the latter comes in a mixture of the geological, corporeal, sexual, and theological. There are erotic descriptions of bodies, recurring references to a volcano on the verge of an eruption, a catalog of skin maladies, tepid pustules, uh, blisters, uh, and other afflictions. Everything's about to burst. And near the end of the poem, the biblical figure of Onan appears in a passage that indicates this mixture. Suddenly now strength and life assail me like a bull, and I revive Onan, who entrusted his sperm to the fecund earth, and the water of life circumvents the papilla of the morn. A morn is a, a kind of uh, mountain. And now all the veins and veinlets are bus bustling with new blood, and the enormous breathing lung of cyclones, and the fire boarded, uh, hoarded in volcanoes, and the gigantic seismic pulse that now beats the measure of a living body in my firm embrace. Sorry. I knew it was going to happen at some point. Every apocalypse is a revelation, uh, and after the appearance of Onan, a voice drills the night like an apocalyptic wasp, declaring an anti-colonial message. Europe has lied. Uh, or, put more strongly, as Césaire does in Discourse on Colonialism, Europe is indefensible. Uh, and so, wow, we've, we've come very far from Talbus in his occidental breath. There's a general consensus that much of this religious or spiritual element, uh, or, or these elements in the 1939 version, are expressed in a more directly political way uh, in the later editions, or especially in the 1956 edition. Yet there's still a clear apocalypticism expressed in the famous passage I quoted earlier. And this edition is accompanied by a more antagonistic position from the outset. So whereas in the first edition, we have to wait for the arrival of the messianic narrator, now, uh, the messianic narrator appears in the first lines of the poem. At the brink of dawn, get lost, I said, you cop face, you pig face, get lost. I hate the flunkies of, the or of order, the cockchafers of hope. I unlaced monsters and I heard rising on the far side of disaster, a river of turtle doves and savannah clover, which I always carry inside me. There's still promise, but, it's not on the, uh, but now it is on the other side of a disaster. Christmas still comes, but Onan is no longer there to impregnate the land with new possibilities. And instead, Césaire writes of blazes of flesh and blazes of cities and playing at the millennium. So how does this poetic intervention, this uh, what we might not necessarily think of as a, a, a go-to resource for political theology, helping us to move beyond the resources of Taubes, Taubes. First, uh, he pre uh, presents a different map of power. He writes from the underside of the underside of the catacomb. Césaire and Fanon both are certainly shaped by the Occident. They're both educated in France. But just as Talbus's Jewishness meant that he did not have to undergo the temptation of Nazism, Césaire's blackness changes his relationship to the world that pretends it is universal. Césaire's poem is simultaneously a tallying of the cost of that pretense and a defiant recognition that the uniform is not necessary. Second, Césaire embraces a vertiginous apocalypse. Uh, for all the style of the opening of Occidental Eschatology, which is itself a beautiful piece of writing, uh, it can't compete with the experience of Césaire's poetry, uh, as Taoist himself, I think, would have been able to make, given his interest in surrealism. He has no need, uh, Césaire, uh, to articulate the logic of an apocalypse that he already feels looming at the end of the first light. This intervention uh, goes beyond critique. He is less concerned with thinking the apocalypse than with thinking apocalyptically. He's, Césaire is writing from a post-apocalyptic context, the dystopian future of a no longer accessible past. And in the face of this loss, he transforms it by inhabiting the abyssal that fully rejects the world. This is an apocalypticism of pure openness. 
there's always the temptation of nostalgia at work in negritude, which has a very complicated relationship, uh, uh, or posits a complicated relationship between blackness and Africa. Uh, so a desire to kind of recover something which has been lost. But at key moments in Césaire's work, we see this apocalyptic fervor in full force. And I think this is part of what I mean when I say that the apocalypse is difficult to think. We're always tempted back by the world to, to give in to a sense of vertiginous openness, to give in to the abyss, to experience the abyss without returning to familiar orientations is difficult. This abyssal is unmoored from the world. It seeks nothing, rejecting teleology or dialectical movements. This is a new form of thought, one which is perhaps better expressed in poetry than, than in philosophy. In the final lines of Césaire's poem, the ones he described to his editor as more vertiginous and more final, he writes of the great black hole where I wanted to drown. Fanon takes up this passage in his book, Black Skin, White Masks. Uh, and, and the book includes an extended meditation on Césaire and negritude more generally. It's actually quite a stunning amount of quoting uh, both Césaire and other poets of, uh, of negritude. And so at the end of this commentary, he quotes a passage from And the Dogs Were Silent, a sort of poetic play uh, by Césaire, in which a captured rebel slave describes the killing of his master as a form of baptism. Uh, and there's good evidence that this is a kind of reworking of a play about the Haitian Revolution. Fanon writes, after having driven himself to the limit of self-destruction, so there's a kind of self-annihilation at work, this rebel is about to leap, whether deliberately or impetuously, into the black hole from which will come the great cry with such force that the pillars of the world will be shaken by it. Again, we have the abyss as the site of the apocalypse. Fanon wants to reduce this act of revolt to its simplest form. It has no justification, no explanation, no logic. It is not rooted in moral certainty or carried out in the name of particular values. One quite simply finds it is no longer possible to breathe. This rejection of the world and of history takes the form of a leap back to Césaire's abyss, which induces, introduces invention into existence. And in this act, Fanon becomes his own foundation. And David Marriott's recent uh, reading of Fanon, he makes this lexicon, abyss, vertigo, leap, invention, central to Fanon's project. And though Marriott does not use the language of apocalypticism, he reads Fanon in a way that conceives of the end, but without promise. Fanon will stress the future present to what is radically open and unpredictable. Less a will be, or will have been, but a not yet that breaks absolutely with any teleology and can there only present itself as a duty without a right. For the act to be an advent, it must not only be absolutely violent to what came before, it has to be strictly unreadable to those who seek to make sense of it as a revelation of knowledge. So working with this lexicon can help us continue to think of apocalypse without a kingdom. Taubes, uh, towards the end of his life in particular, had accepted a more passive view of apocalypticism, which we discussed a little bit earlier. He's ready to watch it all go down, but he doesn't think he needs to start this collapse. And this allows him to oppose the world while remaining accommodated in its terms. And describing, describing a practice of indifference to the world, living as though not, Talbus is indifferent to an imposed world and its consequences. Which wasn't true of Talbus uh, personally. He was very engaged in, in politics. But in his description of apocalypticism, there's this withdrawal which uh, is both opposed to the world, uh, but opposed to the world uh, taken as a universal uh, rather than as a uniform. Uh, and what Fanon gives us is something which is more antagonistic and a, has a murkier sense of agency. The end of the world is something that we might begin, but not something we can accomplish. And the leap, the act, the invention are not triumphs of individual will, but a reaction to a situation in which one cannot do otherwise, uh, a duty without a right. Jared Sexton describes this as a, an aggressive passivity. Confronted with injustices of the world, we can either feel overwhelmed and declare that there's nothing to be done, or claim that we must act now. But Sexton versus Fanon offers us a different approach. At the end of the world, ethics might not be about rightness or wrongness, but about what we must do uh, when we can do something. Schmidt desc uh, describes a coming apocalypse which must be restrained and is the role of the catacombs to delay this coming end, which he only sees as catastrophe. Taub sees it as a promise. The world which Schmidt upholds is a world from which Taub uh, has disinvested. He's ready to watch it all go down. But this apocalypticism is still connected to a coming covenant, a promise, an occidental promise. 
And in opposition to this promise, indeed any promise, I have suggested that Cesare and Fanon both articulate an apocalypticism in which the end is the only thing worth beginning. This end can't be only an end. Taubus tells us as much in Occidental Eschatology, writing that the apocalyptic principle combines within it a form destroying and a forming power. They're never separated. To talk about the end of everything, uh, even in the case of a nuclear uh, holocaust, doesn't really make sense. There's still something there. Something will be created uh, through this destruction. But it's not part of a narrative of progress, redemption, or salvation. The end is an abyss, an unmooring from the world that is also the groundless space of invention. At the beginning of this paper, I said that the end is difficult to think, but I think that there is value in trying to think apocalyptically. The world seems inevitable. It feels inevitable for understandable reasons. It is a condition from which we can conceive the present and any possible future. If we become convinced that this world is unlivable, we're caught in a dilemma. Our capacity to imagine an alternative world is shaped by a world that we have come to resent uh, or even hate, and yet to accommodate oneself seems as impossible as it is repugnant. Apocalypticism gives us a way of thinking through this vertiginous experience. Political theology often focuses on disturbing themes, uh, violence, bare life, trauma, and like any conceptual work, there's a risk of this rendering something like the end of the world uh, familiar rather than terrifying. What could be more difficult to think of the end? Uh, I'm not suggesting that political theology can merely adopt Césaire or Fanon's abyssal apocalypticism for, for many reasons, but in the work that it has inspired, uh, challenge us to, to revisit, to reacquaint ourselves with the, uh, the terror of an apocalypse without a kingdom, uh, with the abyssal that provides no solutions, offers no new covenants, and makes no promises. Thanks. <laughs>